Hello everyone. So I've decided to make this video and I have to say from the start that it's not really a video I really wanted to do. It's not something I really find pleasure in. It's not a subject that I particularly like talking about. Um, but it is one that I think has <sighs> grown in importance, especially of late. Um, and, and that's the the question of the Society of St. Pius X, the SSPX. And it, I've known about them for decades, of course, like like a lot of us have, but um, it, it is sort of coming to a head. I've, I've sort of been able to ignore them for the most part for most of my life, although when I went to college, there was a, an SSPX chapel right down the road, and I never once stepped foot in it. Um, on purpose. Um, for a background to my history with the, the traditional Latin Mass, which I do attend at my local parish here, I'm blessed to have it at my local parish um, in the diocese here. Um, but I never wanted to go to the SSPX, and there's important reasons for that. And um, I'm going to give you kind of a background to this specific video. Um, many of you probably already know that um, Taylor Marshall recently has started doing a number of videos um, talking about the history of the society and the person of Archbishop Michel Marcel Lefebvre um, and asking whether or not they're really all that bad. And then it sort of culminated with his proclamation publicly that on Easter Sunday him and his family went to the society and that he apologized for any both like any mis uh, erroneous things he said about them or critical things he said about them in the past and um it was that last part the obviously <laughs> apologizing for erroneous statements is one thing but to to recant any criticisms um, from the past is what a lot of people found to be the most problematic thing in his video or not in his video in his statement and it, it created a firestorm um, obviously Dave Gordon and Tim Gordon um, replied to that as well Tim you know was closely associated with, with Taylor for a long time it was really hard on him strained the relationship um, and then Dave Gordon sort of put out a you know, I was basically informed that this was taking place on Twitter, which I had not really been on. So I, I kind of hopped on there and started a new Twitter account to see what was going on. And then I saw Dave Gordon, Tim's brother. <clears throat> um, that must stink being known as Tim's brother. I mean, he's, he's his own person, by the way. But um, anyway, I saw that um, he put out a call. He's like, you know, look, it's time for us traditional... Um, members within the Catholic Church um, to start calling out the society and people supporting them because it's not right and it is creating this division and we sh if we're going to be criticizing the church which all of us you know a lot of the traditional people both in society and outside um, you know within the Catholic Church um, criticize a lot of things going on within the church um, that we should also point to the the problems within the traditionalist ranks and say, look, you know, we need to call our the traditionalists to a high standard as well. Um, so that's sort of the background, and so I I stood with Dave, and I was like, I'm 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 with you. I always had been. I mean, as far as the society was concerned, I never wanted anything to do with it. Um, and then so and last night, I'm being this long debate with. Um, Steve Skojak, who I didn't even realize was associated with 1 Peter 5 because I never really read 1 Peter 5, and that ended up becoming a bone of contention accidentally um, on there. And I, you know, um, but anyway, um, got into a long debate with him, and then some other people jumping in, so it was all over the place. And I find Twitter really hard to follow. I'm sitting here like refreshing and going back and trying to figure out who's replying to what strand and how it's all connected, and it gets really confusing after a while. Um, and some person, other person who's a supporter of the society jumped in, was chastising both of us, saying that we had no right as laymen to, um, to be teaching publicly on anything. Um, and so 
asking whether or not we should even have lay Catholic blogs that are not under direct ecclesiastical authority. And, you know, I thought that was a little ironic coming from someone in the society who's concerned about getting ecclesiastical permission to do things since we'll, we'll get to that later. I thought it was ironic, but so as a rebuttal, I mentioned, well, you know, I do have ecclesiastical degrees that give me a license by the church to teach theology, um, even on the masters and seminary levels. Um, and finishing a doctorate of a, a, you know, a doctorate of sacred theology and systematic theology. So I pointed to my credentials, you know, um, just to say that, hey, look, I'm not just a layman in some sense. I, I have been granted ecclesiastical degrees, um, but I actually took his point well. I was like, well, you know, maybe he does have something here, something to consider. You know, how much of this blogosphere should be left unchecked? Um, that's it's a valid question. It's worth pursuing. And some that I'm open to praying about as well. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the background. And I, I thought Steve Skojak's perhaps best statement came at the end where he said he was going to make this one last statement and he was going to back off and just withdraw because it obviously wasn't going to be resolved. And I guess we all could have known that from the beginning. It's just it is important to hash things out sometimes. But um, And... Unfortunately, he then later got back on and started saying he muted me and was dogging me, saying that my university must have just been hurting for money, and that's why they, you know, um, allowed me to attend. And this is what he was implying, saying that my college that I went to must have just been hurting for money because my thoughts were bad, my tweets, my tweets were bad, my thinking was worse or something. I just thought that was pretty low. I mean, <laughs> I've studied for decades. I've been studying theology academically. I've published in things. And, and then he starts like, oh, he's just bragging about his credential or about his studies. I'm like, I wasn't bragging. It was bringing them up in the context of defending both him and our ability to, to discuss faith publicly. And that we didn't, you know, that we had credentials to be able to do that. At least I was doing my own. I don't know his credentials, but... So he was saying it was basically being braggadocious and then starts insulting me. And then Tim Gordon, actually, for his credit, he he actually came to my defense a little bit and admitted that my corrections, um, he actually appreciated because I called him out on something. And he um, later saw that I was I was right about some things that he in, in that he was wrong about some things and he appreciated it. And I thought that was a pretty stand-up thing to do. So I give Tim Gordon a lot of credit for that. And I'm not going to get draw those things. That's a, another thing. But, you know, I think he's a very sincere and genuine person. And, and he also said that he thinks Steve is genuine. And I don't, I'm not, I don't know Steve. So, you know, that's fine. I, I don't appreciate the things he implied and insulted me after he said he was bowing out of the discussion. But I did think that his final comments um, were worth were worthwhile to, to contemplate. And, and it's, but it's stuff I'd already thought about. And what I mean by that, he made, and I'm just going to summarize here. He said that what makes him and others who like himself are not even associated with the society so upset at other Catholics who are cr criticizing the society is that the society, in his words, are obviously dedicated to teaching um, the, the Catholic faith and, and the Orthodox Catholic faith. Um, and celebrating the, <clears throat> the traditional Latin Mass, which is a good thing. And basically then started to go on a rant about how awful things have been in the church since the, since Vatican II and all these bad things. And, you know, we've got, you know, this, that, and the other thing happening and, you know, Father Martin and, um, others like that. And, <sighs> Here's the issue. First of all, that's a false dichotomy. Okay. First of all, Tim Gordon, who is criticizing society, okay, that's sort of him and Dave, do criticize the official church for not being more stand up, for not um, protecting the, the church from liturgical abuses and from heretics. So it's not like they're do they're not and we're not um agreeing with him on those points that those other people are also doing bad things. So you can't just say that, well, because they're doing those bad things, you know, that's worse. Therefore you can't criticize the society or shouldn't. I don't agree with that. I think that's a false dichotomy. And, um, I do agree with him that I think it puts the hierarchy in a really 
tough position to criticize more traditional people when they're refusing to criticize people who are obviously in her heretical, let's just call it what it is. Um, I think that is a problem. And I agree with Steve on that. And I agree with, you know, a lot of people on that. I, and I, you know, I often wonder, you know, do you, do you really think that St. Ignatius of Antioch, St. Cyprian, both St. Cyril's, Jerusalem and Alexandria, St. Basil the Great, St. John Chrysostom, St. Augustine, St. Irenaeus, you think any of these people, um, any of these bishops of the church would have wondered, Pope St. Leo the Great, you know, would they have even taken two minutes to, to wonder and, well, I, I don't know if we should deny communion to pro-abortion pol Catholic politicians or not, you know, it's, you know, no, that's obvious. And it is a scandal that people like Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi have rarely been denied communion, that they should have been censured a long time ago. And the fact that the, the, the hierarchy does fail to censure people of that ilk does make it harder for traditional people to accept um, the criticisms and censures of traditionalists. And, and I understand that. And, and so I'm with him on that. It, it shouldn't just be censuring traditionalists who go astray, but should also apply to the more liberal or heterodox fashion, factions. Um, there are tons of liturgical abuses that just go unchecked, and it's awful, it's terrible, and it's misleading, and it's it's not okay. Um, but I don't think that's the reason not to fraternally correct Society of St. Pius the Tenth supporters um, in the society itself. And here's why. I think that, for one, if we want to try to fight from, for the church from within, which is, right, that's what we're called to do. That's why we say the Protestant Reformation was wrong. It's why the great schism between East and West was bad. You must maintain visible unity. That's a hallmark of Catholic theology. It's like the first principle of you do not break union with Rome. You do not disobey the Pope. You know, the the Psalm definitions of Vatican I, the, the church teaching and law that he is the supreme pontiff who has direct, immediate, full juridical power over the whole church and every individual member. You have to obey him. He has that authority. So you can't prop up the authority of the papacy, you know, the Catholic understanding of the papacy, and then refuse to live it. You know, that's... You can't say, well, that's they're supporting Orthodox teaching, but the, maybe in their words theoretically, but then they're not because they're denying his authority and they're disobeying him. And they're appealing to their own interpretation of it being an emergency situation. But guess what? The law itself says that the Supreme Pontiff, as the Supreme Legislature, is the one who is also the interpreter of the law, the authentic interpreter of the law. So if the Holy Father says that it's not a safe emergency, then it's not. It doesn't justify you. You can't determine that on your own. So let's go a little bit through the history of the society. And I'm not, you know, an expert on the history of the society, but I know something of it. And I just want to cover the highlights and so we can talk about my issues with it. Okay. Um, basically, the society was started in 1970. Um, there were some Seminarians that were kind of having trouble, at, I guess they were in a liberal seminary, and they were getting some flack about um, pre-Vatican II teachings that they were upholding. I don't know what they were. I don't know the details. That would be interesting to know, actually. Um, and so they kind of approached him, and he ended up discerning with them that they were going to start a society, and they got permission from a bishop to do so. And... Um, they were great in this Pio Unio status, which is like a pious union. And it's sort of like the first stage on canonical regulation. It was for six years um, to, as an experimental basis to have this society. Um, and for various reasons, it, it, didn't, it didn't last. In 1975, so five years later, the status was removed after um, cardinals overseeing it granted the bishop who had granted it permission to revoke it. And so they lost that status. Um, in the 1976, Archbishop Lefebvre was going to ordain 
priests of the society, and he was told by Rome he uh, he could not do it. He they forbade it, um, and he went away with he went ahead with those as well. So this also this idea that. You can't judge Lefebvre just based on one act. Well, this isn't once, 1988 thing which that will come to. It's happened. It happened before. So this was a continuous, years-long propensity for disobedience. Um, so he did it anyway, and he was notified that he was suspended automatically, and so were the priests who received orders from him. So for at least a period of one year, they were suspended. They were not allowed to perform any sacraments whatsoever. Um, Priestly faculties were not allowed to be used licitly, um, and in some cases, validly, depending on the sacrament. Um, and Lefebvre himself had even recognized that, oh, you know, this kind of is an irregular status, that's not good, I'm, you know, but it is what it is. And he just sort of kept, he kept going, and despite the fact that he no longer recognized, the society kept doing its own thing. Um... And then it kind of came to a head. There were some dialogues going back and forth. Apparently there was some promise that he would be allowed to, he would be brought back in and they, he'd be allowed to ordain some bishops to continue the, the traditionalist bent within the church or, or trajectory. Um, but then he never got it. So he was worried that he was going to die before he could ordain new bishops and basically requested permission, um, I guess on multiple occasions um, in succession to to be able to do it, and Pope John Paul II kept saying no. So, I mean, Lefebvre knew that he needed permission to do it, and yet, at one point, he was like, that's it, if you're not going to give me permission, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, he was told not to, he was warned, he did it anyway. Um, that incurs a late sententiae that's in the act itself, excommunication. And, you know, he was even warned by Pope John Paul II that it would be considered a schismatic act. And then, so after it happened anyway, that late sententiae excommunication was then also declared, so made public, um, that yes, this, these they have incurred, him and those four bishops, um, as well as the one helping, I think, um, incurred, um, were under the censure of excommunication. Um, so this also creates a problem, it's some legal issues. One, it means they have no jurisdiction. So there's priestly powers and even Episcopal powers, but some of them also, so it's not just, a, you know, for instance, any validly ordained priest can celebrate mass and it'd be considered a valid, but it's not necessarily illicit to do that. So there's an illicit meaning against the law. So it might be valid, consecration might take place, but it's not illicit to celebrate. Um, so... But then there's other sacraments that require, not for their validity, um, some sort of juridical power, some sort of jurisdiction. Um, some people might not know this, but even now, technically, the reason that a priest of one diocese can hear another diocese is, is that the law itself says now that if you have faculties from your diocese, then that priest who has faculties from his, that his own diocese can then hear confessions anywhere unless it's been revoked in a given place by a bishop. Um, but the reality of it is you do have to have valid, you have to have faculties to hear confessions. Just because you're ordained a priest does not mean you can always validly hear confessions without faculties, without the jurisdiction. Um, you cannot accept and states, um, you know, in people in danger of death, immediate danger of death, um, then the law grants that. So there's still, but that's because you're, it's still juridical. The law is granting it in those instances and specifies that. Wasn't the case with the society. Also marriages. There was actually a case I heard of where a cardinal from Spain presided over a wedding that he didn't have juris, he, that was con later considered to be invalid because he hadn't gotten, I think, the approval of the pastor of the parish, which is actually required because it wasn't his diocese. So he didn't have jurisdiction in that diocese and you need to have the um, permission or delegation from the pastor. So it was actually found out that it was invalidly done.
Um, so same with the society, that they didn't have valid confessions or valid um, marriages. So that's been a longstanding bone of contention with me is one reason I, I, I do not like them is that they're, they're proclaiming to be traditional, proclaiming to be Catholic while ignoring the directives of the Supreme Legislature and of the Church, um, the, the Pope, and they were hearing invalid confessions. They were telling people that they were absolving them from their sins and they had no authority to do so and they were invalid. Yes, do I know that they try to create some sort of hermeneutical gymnastics to overcome that and that Lefebvre appealed to the 1917 code? Well, guess what? He appealed to it after 1983. The 1970 code wasn't even in effect. So legally speaking, there's no standing there. Um, but, you know, obviously I'm sure there's going to be a lot of comments trying to defend them and do this gymnastics. The reality of it is, look, visible unity within the church has always been a hallmark of the Catholic Church. They are not <laughs> in full communion with the church. It's only been recently that Pope Francis, you know, they've been granted more and more recognition. You know, Pope Francis for the Year of Mercy granted faculties for hearing confessions, um, basically declaring their their confessions to have valid absolution. And people say, oh, well, look, then he must be recognized that they have jurisdiction. And so, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, okay, but if they already had faculties before that, so from 19... 88 or even 76 up until 2015 they've been doing it without that if they already had it then he wouldn't have had to give it to them so you can't retroactively then say they've been hearing valid confessions and you also can't just say oh we'll see he recognizes them as legitimate no he's doing that for the, the sake of the souls during the year of mercy and then he extended it in 2016 um he did it for their the sake of those souls, so that they wouldn't be getting invalid confessions unbeknownst to themselves. It it's not a formal recognition of some canonical regular status of the society. It's just not. They are at minimum in canonically irregular status and maximum still in schism because they are, according to the code of canon law, schism is defined by refusal to or to separate oneself from um, oh, I forget the exact terminology. Um, basically, it's a refusal or removal of submission to the Roman pontiff. So when you're not submitting to his authority, or it says, a refusal to be in communion with those who are under the popes or who are subjected to the pope, that's a state of schism. Well, they're not in communion with the dioceses around the world. They're not in communion with... Um, they're not under the they're not obeying and under, subjecting themselves to the Roman pontiff. They're remaining in disobedience. And despite a lot of reaching out of Ratzinger, then Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, in his attempts to try to reconcile, and they kept refusing, and then they said they would, and then they wouldn't, and all this back and forth. Um, you know, they've still refused. And I think as good faithful Catholics, we have to be concerned with the salvation of their souls. And that's why I think it matters. I, I don't think the argument there's bigger fish to fry is true. One, because we should be concerned about those who with us consider ourselves ortho, orthodox and or traditional. That we we want to protect ourselves as close as we are in theology or on the need for orthodoxy and love of tradition. Um that we should be concerned for the, our salvation of those who are who are close to us in that regard. And when we see a grave delict, you know, we, we can't just ignore it. And we can't say that, as Steve Skojak did, and he basically said that, look, I and he admitted, it, he's got problems with them. He does not attend their stuff. He's got issues with it. He doesn't, he has, he, he cannot himself even join them in that sense um, because he does have those issues with them. And says, but, you know, basically, why don't we just leave them alone? There's worse people out there. And, and I don't like that. And it somewhat vaguely reminds me, I want to push it too too strongly, but it vaguely reminds me of those who say, well, I'm personally against abortion, but it's up to individuals' decisions. You know, if you're calling out, which he obviously already sees himself, for instance, he sees that they're in grave um, a grave situation and there's fundamental problems with them 
I mean, he's he's admitting it, but he's not really pushing it. He's basically saying, but I don't want to criticize them anyway. But that's just sort of ignoring the problem. And it's perpetuating the problem. Think about how much stronger we could be as a group within the church if we brought them back into full communion, or if they, you know, agreed to submit to the Roman pontiff and accept the offer of a personal prelature, which I, I, would, I, I think they were offered and then declined. Um, and I'm, correct me if I'm wrong on that. I'm, I'm not a perfect historian on all these things. I understand that. Um, <clears throat> but how much stronger we could be if we worked together, if all of the members of the society were in the fraternity of St. Peter or really similar things, or were diocesan doing extraordinary form liturgies, making that more widely available. I mean, it'd be so much better. It would grant people who want to stay within the community of the church, like the Gordons. Tim Gordon would love to go to the traditional mass um, within full ecclesial communion, and yet it's really hard for him. Well, imagine if we did have more people, um, if the society people came over that's why I care. It's hurting the traditionalism or the traditional, it's hurting orthodoxy and traditional practices within the full communion of the church by having them stay outside. So this idea that, oh, we're being divisive by criticizing them. No, the division's already there. We're calling it out and we want to heal it. We want to bring them back. Sort of like the Catholic Orthodox dialogue, which is one of my, my big um, areas of study and publication and concern. I want to bring back the unity, and I'm not going to refuse to call them out because they're overall nice or they're overall they're close to us. You know, I, I think we we need that unity back within the fullness of the Catholic Church under the Supreme Pontiff. And I do think it's problematic when you know for decades you you offer invalid confessions and you know but pretend to be the true Catholics. It, it's not good, you know. I just, I think, I think the reason it bothers me is the same reason it bothered Steve, that he doesn't like people criticizing because obviously they care about orthodoxy and traditional practice. That's why I, I actually feel like it, they need to be called out. You know, the, the, the corruption of the greatest is the worst. And Satan loves to use that. He loves to take what's most sacred and what's most beautiful and most true and twist it. You know, get that 99% truth in there and then throw in an error if you can, if it's going to make people fall, you know. Um, get them rallied up so, well, prideful about the fact that they are orthodox and then blind them to their own uh, heterodox ways. You know, it's it's interesting to see how you know, Ratzinger once said that at bottom, a lot of traditionalists and liberals are the same. They pick one area of the church and they say that's it. Or, you know, they just, they they both end up doing, <laughs> some making some of the same arguments, which is appeal to personal conscience. Um, and, and, you know, talking about good intentions, all over objectivity. Well, that's sort of like the liberal argument being used by the society. Well, you know, he meant well, look at the whole of his life. He had good reasons or good intentions for doing it, even if objectively it was against disobedience. And, you know, his personal conscience would say this. Well, you know, it sounds like a very liberal argument to me. And you see this all the time. And it's what the reformers used as well. Somehow they were justified in their disobedience and their, and their separation. Um, and, and I just, I don't, I don't like it because I, I, I worry about the salvation of their souls and I worry about the salvation of souls of people who don't know any better being drawn into it. I'd rather have them being fishers of men within the Catholic fold. We could use that. Um, and, and that's why I find it to be important. Um, and again, I'm not, I don't think I know everything. I'm not saying that there aren't a lot of hard feelings here and difficulties. But I am saying we need, 
we need to at least accept that there is a canonical structure, there is a juridical structure of the church, it is a visible unity, and we cannot break it. And yes, I do think at the same time we need to start calling out and calling for bishops and Rome to be more forthright in condemning heresies and addressing liturgical abuses and other, you know, um, bad practices. I, I do think we need to do that. So I just wish we could do that together. And I don't think us criticizing the society is what's leading to that division. It's their existence outside the church makes our existence within the church more difficult because then other people within the church that are more liberal say, oh, you're just like those folks. So that doesn't, that doesn't really help our, our cause. And it gives a, a bad reputation to the extraordinary form. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's important. I really do. And maybe in, in later episodes, we'll talk more about like Dignitatis Humanae, who, um, which has been pointed out to me is probably one of the biggest areas of disagreement. And I've also seen statements where they don't actually have a doctrinal problem with Vatican II per se, um, or if they do, it's on very uh, just a very small few points. Well, okay, if, if that's true, then how come from that's all they ever talk about? I've never, if they, there's only a couple of minor points in Vatican II that really they think justifies not obeying, which, by the way, Lefebvre signed all the documents. So he was at Vatican II um, and signed them all. Now, maybe he didn't want to, but he did. Um, if, if it is true that it's only some of those, then why is it that a lot of people in the traditionalist movement who talk about Vatican II basically just say, throw it out, like Taylor Marshall says? Um, just, it's all bad. And that's another thing, you know, when Steve had mentioned that you know, nothing Orthodox has really come out since 1965, or at least nothing as Orthodox as what the society teaches, that just strikes me as really bad. I mean, you have multiple saints, and by the way, canonization is considered part of papal infallibility, so Pope St. John Paul II is actually a saint, and so is John the Twenty Third, and so is Pope Paul the Sixth. And you look at the teachings on Veritati Splendor and um, the CDF document Dominus Jesus, Communionis Notio. I mean, I argued Humani Vitae, and I got flack for that. If somehow that wasn't traditionalist enough. Um, can you really say that nothing good has come? And, and I think that's the other point is I think a lot of the society people and those who follow them, and even some traditionalists who are within the Catholic Church fold, have, have sort of gotten this blinders on that nothing good, if you can't say anything good about anything from the magisterium after Vatican II, or starting with Vatican II. It's a very bad way of looking at things, and it doesn't help the cause. Because it also means you're missing a lot of great things that are in there. The churches did not die in 1962 with this opening of the Second Vatican Council. There are great things that have come out. We should be talking about those and teaching them and relishing them, and not only complaining about bad things, even though there are a lot. So I think that's another reason, because I think they're missing out on a lot of good things, because they're not even, it doesn't seem like they're willing to look at any of it. They're just, you know, I, the whole thing's just sad. And it really does break my heart. And I, I think we do have to boldly call them out, call them to repentance, and bring them back into in union. And I think, as many have pointed out, that there needs to there does need to be a dialogue about their issues. But from what I understand, they did have those, even with, and they weren't able to resolve them even then. But I would like to see point counterpoint discussions. Um, on their questions. I think that that's, that would be healthy. Um, but we have to obey. We have to be in the union of the church. That's the hallmark of Catholicism. You, you can't throw that out and then claim that you're the true Catholics. That's, that's my biggest issue. And I apologize that I'm rambling a little bit. Um, but that's where I'm at.
you know, I think, I think Dave's right. I think we do need to address this and it's going to hurt. It's painful to address um, family squabbles, if you will, but it needs to be done because there is real danger there. Um, and yeah, there's danger elsewhere too, but that doesn't, you can't say, oh, but look at that danger to ignore this one. That's not a good argument. So I think, I think this needs to happen. And I think we do need to stand up um, against the society. And when I say against the society, I really mean for them. For them becoming canonically regular. You know, sometimes in the spiritual battle, you have to understand that spiritual warfare is the one warfare, the only warfare that's fought for the sake of your human enemies. You're trying to battle against them for them. And that's how I think we should see it. God bless.